StarCraft II Story Q&A panel. Please join me in welcoming our panelists, Chris Smetson and Brian Kindrigan. Hello. Hello, BlizzCon. What would you guys like to talk about? Hi, Chris. Uh, one of the last things Rainer said to Tychus was, Tychus, if we can save her, I'm going to take her away from this place. Can you elaborate? <laughs> we can't say too much about Heart of the Swarm, I don't think. Um, but it looks like Chris was about to say something, and I cut him off. No, I was going to remark that, oh, wow, we're at the StarCraft panel. The brain's catching up a little bit. Tyke it. Ty oh. <clears throat> I can say, I mean, Jim has, uh, has spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, what ifs and, and all of the possibilities uh, that were out there for him and Sarah. Um, with, with the, the sort of bond that they had from, from back in the day. Um, so it's certainly true that he, he spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, what if I could get her back somehow? What if I could save her? Um, so he won't be entirely uh, making things up as he goes along. Can you rephrase the question? Well, it's a tricky question because I want to handle it delicately. But... So do I. You surprised the hell out of us with how things ended in uh, the first chapter. Uh, we all thought we knew how it was going to end, that things weren't going to work out the way they did. But you surprised the hell out of us. Did you like it? I loved it. Yeah. I was like... I, it was amazing. I was like, there's no way. We all know this isn't going to work. It's going to end on a really dark note, and Jim's just going to be crushed. But you guys were like, yeah, no, that's not how it's going to happen. And you surprised the hell out of us. So I think we all thought how this was going to go down a certain path. Heart of the Swarm, Kerrigan being a bitch, evil, horrible person. Third chapter, Protoss, Zero Tool coming in, saving the day. But you turned everything on its head with how things ended with the first chapter. So I think we're all kind of wondering how Kerrigan's really going to play this out now that she's... No longer the Queen of Blades. Right. Well, I mean, that, that's kind of the question, right? Um, obviously, we can't get too into it uh, or, 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 or into very specific answers because that's, that's exactly what we're building right now. We want to spoil the whole story. Um, but it's interesting. Like, the last number, I, I'll rip a little bit, the last number of BlizzCons, right? Mm -hmm. We've been up here... And we haven't been able to say anything, right? Because the game wasn't out yet. Um, so it's really weird. It's kind of hitting me at this BlizzCon. We can actually talk about StarCraft. Um, although we don't want to give a whole lot away relative to Heart of the Swarm at all, um, I think we can talk thematically about this girl, about this guy, uh, for sure. So the whole crux of this thing is what will this girl do now? She has only ever been manipulated by, you know, whether it was the, you know, the Dominion and then Mengsk and then, you know, this, this overmind, right? She has only ever been manipulated. Has she really ever made her own decisions? Has she ever really known who she is and chosen who she wants to be? Uh, so essentially, Heart of the Swarm is aptly named, right? It is exactly about that. Uh, what will this girl do? Uh, do these two lonely... Wonderful people have a chance in hell. Uh, you are who you choose to be. You are who you choose to be, man. Um, but that, that cuts right to it. So again, there's, there's not too much we can say to reveal what's going on in Heart of the Swarm, but... Um, oh, hell, I forgot what the question was. In other, the other than to say, I hope, I hope we keep surprising you that much. <laughs> <laughs> hell yeah. That was pretty huge. You guys are just on the top of your game. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Irene, and I was just wondering if we can look forward to seeing more of uh, Valerian Manx in the Heart of the Storm. <laughs> hmm, I I'm sensing a trend here. Everybody <laughs> wants to talk about Heart of the Swarm. Um, I, I think it's safe to say that Valerian is uh, a very important part of the Caprulu sector and everything that's going on there. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't think he's going to disappear. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Valerian definitely has a, uh, a role to play uh, in how things shake out. Awesome. Awesome. So, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hello. Uh, my question is about the Dark Templar. Uh, specifically, their unit is described in the game as using warp blade technology. How would you describe that, and in what way does it compare to a zealot's psionic blades? That's a good one. Um, off the top of my head, psi blades come from within, and warp blades are pulled from without. Basically, power I mean, of the cosmos, baby. Yeah, I mean, basically, any any Protoss that that is a part of the Kala is going to have enormous psionic energy to draw on, and and can create, you know, obviously uh, uh, weapons and blades with it. Um, the the Dark Templar, uh, you know, in, in all of the lore, they've they've because they chose to go their own way, and they don't have the power of the Kala behind them, but they have the power of enormously strong individual will mm -hmm. um, are, it's sort of, uh, I mean I, actually I'm, I'm giving a long winded version of the same answer I think uh, that Chris just gave you know, one, one is pulling that power from within um, whereas the, the, the Dark Templar have to, to take what is around them, the void right. and, and manifest it so it's um, it is a completely different philosophy but both are really cool weapons Thank you very much. All right, my name is Steven. Oh, yeah. um, first off, just want to say hello to Josh and Mandy who are watching at home. And this question is also from them as well as myself. Um, simply put, Wings of Liberty, great campaign. Loved it, just loved it, especially the ending. Um, there are a few missions, such as the colonist mission, I believe the final colonist mission, and then also the one with New Folsom, where you have to make a choice in what you choose to do, which direction you want to take. Um, what I would like to know is, though, are you guys ever going to kind of let us know which decision you think or is going to be the canon direction, or is it strictly going to be left up to the player's interpretation based on what they chose? I only ask this just because, you know, the things that we encountered in those missions obviously will have pretty big implications later on. Brian? Uh, sure. I, yeah, I can say that uh, um, we, we do say that the, the A choice that you made was the canon uh, decision. So uh, in terms of, of StarCraft canon, um, Raynor, Raynor sided with Tosh and, uh, and Raynor helped the colonists against Selendus. Um, that said, uh, I, I really uh, would like to not have any player feel like their choice has been invalidated. Um, so, I mean, in general, uh, except for when, you know, the implications become overpowering, um, I think I'm, I'm going to try to stay away from uh, going back and examining that stuff, uh, except when we really need to, so that you, you can play the game and really feel like your choices uh, are being carried forward. And, and we do have the, the technology to check your save game, by the way. Any, anything right. to add? Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. All right. Hi. Um, first, I've got a really, really simple yes or no question. Uh, the uh, official sort of insurrection and retribution campaigns from the original StarCraft, are those canon or not? Uh, and then more importantly, what's going on with Samir Duran? Because we didn't see him at all in Wings of Liberty, although we did see the fruits of his labors. Uh, so to the first point, I don't know. Um, 
My instinct tells me that they should not be canon. Uh, but I'd have to look at them again, because there's probably good DNA there that might be useful. Huh? Sure. Uh, so relative to Duran, um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, he has not forgotten. We could certainly say that. Um, Insurrection? Uh, Duran uh, is... Um, part of a larger story that is still unfolding. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's hints of it in Wings of Liberty. Uh, there's more hints of it than you might think uh, in the sense that, that at a later date when you have more knowledge, you might, you might go back and play Wings of Liberty and, and see some stuff. Um, so it's certainly not, uh, um, you know, just a character that, that, that fell by the wayside. Uh, he, he has a part to play in, in the, the greater story of the StarCraft universe. Totally. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, also at the heart of the swarm, I'm just wondering if you could give us a chronological ordering of if it takes after Wings of Liberty, and if so, how long after? I don't know that we should do that. You want to do that, don't you? Uh, I want to do it all. <laughs> all right, if you don't want to do it, I'll side with you. Don't. Well, I think you can answer. I think you can answer half of it. Just does it take place after? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But not be specific about. Okay. All right. Oh, it's not the lawyers. They don't care. It's, it's, uh, it's We're protecting just, your experience exactly. of the product. Just picture yourself when Heart of the Swarm comes out, sitting in front of your, your computer, playing it. And do you really want to feel like, oh, I knew that was going to happen. I, I saw that on YouTube from that. Or uh, do you want to be, oh, my God. You know, so we want to protect yeah. that. You, while it's installing, you should be saying, what is the timeline? Um, so, okay. Chris, Chris has prevailed upon me to, uh, against my better instincts, no. <laughs> uh, to say that Heart of the Swarm um, takes place after Wings of Liberty. An unspecified amount of time between the two. Right. Thank you. Less Thank you. than 100 years. <laughs> but greater than one hour. Right. Right. First off, gentlemen, thank you for creating one of the greatest gaming experiences of all time. All right on. Thanks, Thanks guys. And thank you for being in control of your creative liberty. The question I have is, the Zelnaga, will we ever get to see them either in a flashback or some way that we can see what they had planned and how it went wrong, either regarding the dark voice or with the corruption that he did, will we see them physically in the game? It's a tough question to answer because um, it's a complicated answer. Uh, let's say this, all things will be revealed for certain. Uh, but whether we, we, it's a weird question. I think we can also say that the Zelnaga are an integral part of the whole, the whole thing. Right. Uh, so now whether we see them in their, like their most classical form, you know, what did they look like a million years ago? What did they look like four million years ago? That's harder to say because we're still digging a lot of that stuff out. What do you perceive when we really start to throttle up on that thematic? Uh, it's still kind of in flex, so I'm not sure how to answer it, but they certainly, at a thematic and practical level, uh, they dominate what is the truest story of StarCraft. And they're not going to look like gnomes. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Hey, Chris, I have a question about the UED. Are we ever going to get the backstory of Earth and how the psionic purges turned out? And will we ever see any sign of the UED ever again in the next games? Uh, off the top of my head, um, I think it is potentially very fertile soil 
uh, relative to what StarCraft II is, um, I can probably spare you all the suspense. Uh, we won't be going to Earth in StarCraft II, uh, but I think uh, there's any number of bitchin' stories we could you know, conjure uh, relative to that era or those eras. Um, it's not quite on our radar right now, but I think that's really interesting stuff. Thank you very much. Get those creative juices flowing. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, Hello. My question is actually a bit of a plot clarification that's nagged at myself and some forum goers. Um, in StarCraft II, we see Tychus and Raynor take control of the Odin and basically do as they will with it right under Manx's nose. And then later, the revelation concerning Tychus's connection to Manx, I was wondering how it was that that all went down without him finding out about it and putting a stop to it. That is a good one. That is a very good question. Uh, uh, Brian. Um, hi, Chris. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, in my mind, uh, uh, during um, Media Blitz, the, the, the mission where uh, um, Tychus is doing that, uh, I don't know that Mengsk always had a direct feed open. Um, because really, uh, you know, Tychus is wandering around the Hyperion, and um, if, if his suit is constantly broadcasting every conversation that he has, or even tight beaming every conversation that he has, there's a pretty good chance that uh, Swan or someone else is going to, uh, right. to pick up on it. Um, so, uh, we, you know, in this game, we usually, uh, we have to sort of, Give, give you bits and pieces of the story, the, the most relevant ones, and uh, everything else should make sense, but sometimes we do need the, the, the player to kind of work with us on that. So uh, my thinking on Tychus's suit and, and how much information Mengsk gets from it was that, uh, you know, periodically, it's sort of like info drops, uh, periodically there would be a very short compact, encrypted, tight beam transmission for an eighth of a second that would go out to a specific satellite or, or whatever. Um, so it's not, you know, it's not that Manx had uh, uh, a constant knowledge of everything that Rainer's Raiders was up to. What Manx had was a gun to Tychus's head. And so, you know, he would get, he would get regular reports, but the idea was that when the key moment came, when, when Tychus was able to do, you know, what he had to do, I don't know why I'm speaking in code, like I'm going to spoil the end of, of a game that you've probably all played. Uh, but, you know, when the moment came that Tychus would have to uh, attack Sarah, um, you know, Manx fully expected Tychus to turn on the, the, the broadcast, right? Like now we're going to have direct uh, communication. Right. Um, and again, what, what Manx was looking at is a very simple uh, uh, proposition that I've got a guy who I can kill at the flip of a switch, and he knows what he has to do, and, and he's a pretty experienced combat guy. Like, I, I can trust that he's gonna do this, or he's gonna die, and he knows that I have no trouble killing him. Because Mengsk is a chess player. He's, he's a guy who understands that you play, you play the man, not the hand, right? Like, he understands the, the, the motivations involved. Um, so I think he, he felt it was a pretty safe bet that, that uh, uh, Tychus would do the, the right thing at the right time, and or of course wrong thing. he did. Well, the right thing by Mengsk's right. standard. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, first off, I'd just like to say, not only was, this, uh, was the gameplay of StarCraft II phenomenal, but the cinematic presentation just out of this world. Um, Chris, I'm a huge fan. I love how you've uh, really been kind of the mastermind behind many of these stories. And I love to go deeper. So my question is, what's coming down the pipe as far as StarCraft II related novels? Good question, and thank you for the props. Uh, StarCraft II related novels. Uh, have we? I don't think we have. But you know, I just don't know. Did you like Heaven's Devils? Yeah, great. <laughs> great book. Well. It, it, uh, more of that. There's more of that. That story will continue. All right. Well, it's like sure.
Let's do it. All right, so we're doing a follow-up. It's already written. We did a follow-up to Heaven's Devils. It's called Devil's Do. Uh, it is written by a girl you may know named Christy Golden, who actually wrote the hell out of this thing. It's like a, it's like a cowboy book. So where Heaven's Devils was kind of Jim and Tychus in the army, this is the sequel where it's kind of like Butch and Sundance, right? They're just two outlaws on the run, you know, robbing trains, kicking butt. It's kind of like they're, you know, they're kind of... Uh, you know, rascally years, and uh, Christy wrote the hell out of this thing, so I'm very excited for you guys to get to see a little bit more about uh, Jim and Tychus' uh, shenanigans over the years, um, and it definitely gives a little bit more insight into just kind of who Jim is and what his arc has been, um, what we see him trying to atone for in the present day, you know, the, the sins of his past. Can't wait. Thanks a lot, guys. Yeah. Uh, hi, I was just wondering what Menk's uh, actual plan for Tychus was, given uh, Rainer's what he had to go through just to get to Kerrigan. Right. Well, I mean, I, I, think, I think at base, Menk had been fighting Rainer for years, right, to a standstill. Uh, you know, different battles, hit and run tactics, uh, and he could not make this rebel go away. Um, so he used things like the media to try and paint Jim as a has-been and things like that. Uh, but essentially, when the Kerrigan threat, you know, kind of, well, technically, technically, uh, hold on, let me compute. I think you stumbled upon a giant plot hole. <laughs> Let's talk this through. We're family. It's all good. All right. So, if Manx let Tychus out of prison before the Zerg invasion began. Indeed. Why did he do that? Hmm. Well, I know my version of events. <laughs> you pull this off. I'm going to be very impressed. <laughs> no, well, to me, again, um, Mengsk is a chess player. He is, he is uh, a, a mastermind, but not, uh, I want to make clear, you know, sometimes people say, oh, this guy's a mastermind. So, yeah, he saw all the moves coming. He saw everything, all of it. And, and we're not saying that because right. he's not, um, you know, he's not, uh, he can't see the future. Uh, and he is not the source of, of all plots in, right. in, in the StarCraft universe, just a lot of them. Um, but uh, as Chris mentioned, Jim Rayner was the biggest thorn in his side. Like he, you know, uh, uh, per the press conference at the beginning of Wings of Liberty, he thinks that Jim Rayner is the worst thing that could happen. Um, but he's smart enough to know he can't just assassinate the man. That'll just turn him into a martyr. Um, so he needs to destroy Jim. And um, it seems to me that, that as soon as he realized he had this, this guy in jail, he had Tychus Finley, that's a perfect opportunity to put him in the suit, you know, which is the gun to his head, and then, and then unleash him on Jim right. and see what happens. You know what I mean? If, if, uh, if the Zerg hadn't showed up again, if Kerrigan hadn't uh, rolled on out of Char, um, you know, there's a good chance that within six months, Banks would have found an opportunity to use Tychus right. to destroy Jim in some other way. Push him over the edge. Yeah. You know. So it was, it was a fishing line. It was, we're going to throw this hook out there, and there's only one fish in the pond. And then all of a sudden, there was another fish in the pond. And it's like, wow, this is great. It was, it was a, a, a very good thing for Manx. Thank you. And uh, is Tychus actually dead? Well, I, I guess I'll say, uh, if I had my way, and I know this will be unpopular, I would say totally. However, the artists on the dev teams, uh, they refuse to believe that Tychus is dead. And they, uh, they envision him with the you know, tentacles coming out of his face and things like that. So we'll see who wins that war when we get back home. But uh, you, know, you never know. You never know with us. Thank you. Does anybody ever really die? Right. I mean, right. Hi, uh, my question is, you know, we, it's wonderful for Jim and Sarah that these ancient artifacts magically bring her back to humanity. 
but is it all, that's all just fulfilling the prophecy that somebody makes these ancient artifacts a million years ago so that in case a girl gets turned from Terran to Zerg and infested <laughs> and, you know, all this, it's, you know, just in case that happens, we'll leave these artifacts lying around and somebody can put them all together and assemble them and restore her. That, I mean, it seems a little that, deus ex machina that, that without... That sounds remarkably convenient, doesn't it? Yeah, a bit. Mm -hmm. um, has, uh, I wonder if, it, if it's uh, occurred to you that the, the transformation might be a byproduct of something else, a side effect of something else that that artifact is doing. Sure, I look forward to finding out what that is. <laughs> <laughs> At the moment, it just seems we, really we convenient for We look forward to Jim. showing it. <laughs> Thanks. Yes. No, I, I, I promise you that there, there is actually uh, uh, meaning to this. Little more going on than is obvious. And... And when future expansions are out, come to BlizzCon, and, and if I'm lying to you right now, call me on it. Assuming I'm not dead. Right. Hey guys, um, two, two questions related to the Dominion leadership. Obviously in the sort of bonus mission during the campaign, we find out that the Dominion has been experimenting. Uh, experiments that have resulted in the creation of a hybrid, which is a prevalent sort of theme during the Protoss side missions. Uh, one is, what can you tell us about, did the Dominion know what they were doing with sort of you know, the splicing of the DNA or whatever you want to call it? And did they know that it, their experiments would result in the creation of the hybrids? And also, you know, we see after Media Blitz that you know, there's rioting going on in Core Hall, there's, there's all kinds of revolts going on in the, in the Core Worlds. What is the state of the Dominion leadership? Uh, you know, really kind of what's going on uh, over there as well. You want to take one half? Sure. Which one? Um, I'll take the second one. Damn, that's the easy one. Okay, uh, I can no. take the first one. Oh, no, I'm taking the first one. All right, fine. Go. You called it down. Uh, oh, hell, what was the first one? First one, hybrids, yes. Oh, you should have taken this. Uh, oh, you know what? I, actually, I can answer the first one very simply. Do you, you asked, do, does the Dominion know, uh, did they know what they were doing, what they were getting into, and, you know, or was this like a happy accident? I will say that somebody knew what they were doing. Someone uh, mm. involved with the Dominion knew exactly what they were doing. Uh, it was not a, a happy accident um, in a lab somewhere. Right. Whether, whether every, all of the Dominion folk involved in the program necessarily know, uh, that's, that would be a, a, a bigger question. Right. The uh, second part was uh, state of the Dominion government. So, Maysk is still in charge, uh, but things have gone pretty south on him. Uh, likely the, the riots and civil unrest or whatever will continue, um, and whole worlds may attempt to cede from, from, from the Dominion. Uh, while he's still in charge, things have definitely changed, and I think he's going to be in a far more desperate state to hold things together, because now he's just totally been found out, and people are not altogether pleased at what kind of man that he is. Guys, we waited 3,500 days for StarCraft <laughs> II. I just want to tell you the experience that it was. I'm willing to wait another 3,500 uh, days for the end of this series, so take awesome, your time man. and do your thing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, hey, that um, news guy, what's his name? Donnie Vermillion in the campaign? Stay classy, BlizzCon. Yeah. I was wondering, you know, in Heart of the Swarm, can you have the guy shot? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that's uh, wow, you, you really didn't like Donnie, huh? Most annoying man ever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll see what we can do. We'll definitely, uh, we'll try to get him shot if we can. Thank you very much. What about uh, Kate Lockwell? How did you guys feel about her? Wow. Some Kate love. You guys want to know something really funny? This is like the weird trivia stuff that we don't even know is trivia yet. But no joke, based on that question, <laughs> the art guys had designed Donnie as a cyborg, and we totally had a scene during all this core hall stuff where he gets shot and he's a, a, a robot. Um, he's and we pulled it because we. Huh? Or he's revealed to be a robot. Totally. Yeah. You know, so we, we just, uh, you know, production time, we just decided to kind of cut it. But 
But now, in fact, if you if you open the tool set and you uh, poke around and find Donnie's model, you'll you'll find a, a robot right. injured, pretty shot fun. Donnie. Hi. Uh, at near the end of uh, Brood War, um, Rainer uh, vowed to kill Kerrigan after she was involved in the death of uh, one of his best friends, Phoenix. Uh, how do you reconcile that with the fact that in StarCraft II, Wings of Liberty, uh, Raynor seems fixated on instead saving Kerrigan, uh, even at a great risk to all of his friends and crew members, and seems to have forgotten who Phoenix is? Oh, I don't think he's forgotten who Phoenix is at all. Uh, and I guess the, the, the pithy response would be, it ain't over yet. And I don't mean anything by that, but... Uh, I think the context of her changed radically. The events of Brood War and uh, components of the, the first game, he's under the conclusion that there is nothing in the universe that will save this girl. She is simply the Queen of Blades, it's done. Uh, and she just proves to be more and more evil over time. Uh, the significant thing that occurs in Wings of Liberty, you know, Valerian tells him, like, hey, there might be a chance to bring her back. It's a game changer for him. He never allowed himself hope. He never considered it could be a possibility. Uh, it changed his whole sense of thinking. Now, there's still things that'll play out. Uh, I'm not suggesting he's gonna kill Kerrigan. I guess I'm not suggesting that he won't either. <laughs> I mean, even if they get together, you know, relationships are rough, right? So, you know, any normal Wednesday night at home, she burns the steak and, you know, uh, There's no excuse for domestic abuse. I know. God. Um, yeah, and I would, uh, I, I would add to that that uh, I think the key thing um, about that moment where, where Rainer turns left instead of right is that, uh, you know, the, there was a big question, I think, that a lot of people in the Caprulu sector would have had, which is, is, so the Queen of Blades, is, that, is she like a completely different person? Or is that just a really pissed off Sarah Kerrigan with a lot of power and, and tentacles, you know? Um, and I think that Jim had such a connection with Sarah that, that he just, uh, he could not believe, uh, he, he could certainly hate and want to kill the Queen of Blades, but when he was confronted with the question of whether or not that was really Sarah Kerrigan or if the real Sarah was in there somewhere and could be brought back, there was no way he couldn't take that chance and, and try to bring her back. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, you guys got a great game here. Um, I was particularly impressed with the character development and surprised by Tassadar's semi-resurrection as a ghost. My question is, is he going to be is this a one-time deal or is he going to be a ghost dad and stick around a little bit more? That's a really good question. Uh, let's handle this delicately. Uh, Uh, yeah, uh, well, we, we, we can't remotely begin to speak about things about the, the protest campaign down the line. Uh, let me just say that there's probably some kind of metaphysical tie between the ancient protoss hero Adun and then through Tassadar uh, that will kind of continue to play out is, is uh, one of our, like, really flavorful potential plot lines, but we haven't made any uh, total calls on it yet in terms of actually what will go into the Protoss campaign, but uh, there's a lot of rich potential with Tassadar and the nature of him and the nature of the Kala um, and what he really represents to the Protoss people, but uh, it would be premature to get into it all at this phase. I like your response. <laughs> right on. <laughs> Hi, my question is that at the end of Brood War, we see Kerrigan basically obliterate the UED, the Dominion, and um, what's left of the Protoss. So how do we kind of reconcile that with just Rainer and the Hyperion kind of steamrolling her at every meeting, especially with her on the battlefield? Um, well, I think uh, the... What's that? Nothing. Oh, uh, the... Uh, the instances where you see her in uh, Wings of Liberty, um, 
one of the things that, that, that we are trying to imply in that story is that she has forces out looking for uh, uh, all of the parts of the artifact too and she doesn't necessarily have all the same knowledge um, that, that Rainer has through the, the, the Mobius Foundation. Uh, so, you know, the, the idea is that her swarm is certainly overpoweringly strong, but it's also spread when they, when they come boiling off of char, they go, you know, 360 degrees, they go everywhere, and they're, they're, they're like uh, sort of carpet bomb searching, if you will, like they're just looking everywhere. Uh, whereas Rainer is, is targeted and focused. So he's never, fa even when Kerrigan's on the map, he, Rainer is never facing the entire swarm. Because yes, if he did, that battle would be over in, in about five seconds. Um, so, so he's really, he's, he's fighting uh, like smaller task forces that she's, she's made. And so even, uh, you know, when she does appear on a map though, she's scary as all heck. I mean, <laughs> first time I played that mission, you know, and I saw her on a map, I, I, I was actually terrified. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I hope that we didn't treat her too lightly. I, I don't think we did. Thank you. Uh, hi. So, the uh, StarCraft manga have introduced a lot of uh, esoteric creatures into the lore, and I'm wondering how they factor into the future of the series, specifically the uh, Phoenix Energy Beast and Gestalt Zero? Uh, we're kind of still discussing how all those ideas play out. Um, it would be premature to comment. We're still kind of working on those. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it's safe to say that uh, you know, the, the Protoss, the Terran, and the Zerg are the, are the marquee right. races of the StarCraft universe. Um, they, they feature prominently and import, importantly in, in all of the, the mainline stories that we're telling. But that doesn't mean they're the only life forms. Um, they're, they're, you know, space is a very crowded place, hmm. in, at least StarCraft space is. Uh, so so there, there are certainly other things going on out there. Um, I'm a fan of the old StarCraft as well as the new one, <laughs> but I was so impressed that you put the extra story into it. I mean, considering it's an RTS game, that just blew my socks off. Uh. And what I really enjoyed the best is the character development. I actually had to play through it twice to fully understand the characters, and it was just Awesome. Oh, so you. my question is, <laughs> when's that next book coming out that you were talking about? <laughs> yeah, well, we, you, you know, it's done. funny. We, uh, we probably weren't supposed to have rolled that out, but we got to give you guys something. Come on. Uh, but uh, you know, I don't, I don't exactly know when the publishing date is supposed to be, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna find out. And my other question is, who, if there is any major group of people. Who designed Tychus Findlay's character? I'm going to handle that. Uh, particularly, Tychus came about, if I'm remembering right, um, our cinematic director, Nick Carpenter, and our writer, Andy Chambers, were sitting and jamming on ideas for just kind of cinematic hooks. Um, so we love the idea of just having Jim kind of in the war years, right? Just having little kind of short film type animatics uh, and it seemed necessary to have someone for him to riff with right some old war buddy uh, and so Nick had kind of come up with the you know the kind of look for this big tough old buddy of Jim's uh, and I think it was Andy who coined you know the, the Tychus Finley name and then very quickly all these little affects started following oh, it was well, it's, this you know hard-hitting Irish brother you know uh, spent time in the can you know like all these little details started to fall out uh, but really, I, I, I got to tell you, the, the Tychus character was interesting and structurally necessary, uh, but it wasn't until we got into that studio and uh, Neil Kaplan kind of hit the voice out of nowhere, right? Uh, and he just starts going. Yeah, I'm like, holy cow, how is that sound coming out of that man? And like immediately, Tychus just took over. Uh, 
I mean, he was a totally secondary, you know, uh, afterthought character. Uh, but once Neil started saying his lines, he was like by far the funnest character to write. Like he just took over uh, us as we were writing the game because it was just so, you Absolutely. could just hear it in every yeah. line. Oh, you know, like, so fun to write for. Yeah, totally. I lost nine years in prison on account of you. <laughs> Jimmy. Well, thank you very much for putting so much into this story. And Tychus is not dead or have tentacles. Raider <laughs> just winged him a well, little. Yeah, well, <laughs> we'll see what we can do. Flesh wound. Flesh wound. Hi. I, I, I want to start off sorry, saying uh, I love StarCraft 2. I love the StarCraft and the Warcraft universes. They're my two favorite universes I've, I've played since I was a kid. And with that, my point involves both. My question involves both games. Um, StarCraft One was a really gritty, dark game where bad stuff happened, and it happened, and that was that was just how it went. And then uh, Warcraft comes along, and it's more fantasy. There's more uh, like the paragon of good and evil. And then I was just wondering if you guys are gonna, if you guys noticed the really close draw between um, StarCraft 2 and Warcraft, well, World of Warcraft, where Kerrigan kind of became Thrall. She was this evil thing, evil person, and then she just suddenly became possibly a very good character, even if she didn't know it. And then you have um, the Zerg kind of just get, got the orc complex, where they were bloodthirsty, and then, well, maybe they were just corrupted. You don't know. And so I'm just wondering, like, are you guys going to bring StarCraft back to that universe where it's really gritty and there's actually punishment for being evil instead of just suddenly being good? And there's uh, consequences to the really good people without them suddenly becoming really evil? Uh, no, we're just going to do exactly what Warcraft did, you know. Uh, so that's a complicated question. Um, to answer it in truth, we'll give too much away. Keep in mind, Heart of the Swarm is about what this girl is about. And by extension, what are the Zerg about? Because uh, it runs a lot deeper than what you've seen so far. That being said, uh, and, and, and as a direct answer uh, to your question, uh, it's highly unlikely we're going to make a decision to suddenly transform the Zerg into this lawful, good, heroic. Uh, the Zerg are the Zerg. Uh, no matter what, they are terrifying, they are violent, they are animals. Uh, that will not change. Uh, that being said, all sorts of things can change. Uh, but again, we are currently working on all that stuff and still feeling out uh, the storyline and what we want to do with the Zerg. Uh, but the scary component cannot be compromised. Uh, relative to the, you know, the Warcraft thing, I guess sometimes race, racial concepts, uh, there are thresholds, right? Uh, did we break orcs in pop culture, you know, kind of making them a little more, a little more noble? Um, not sure what the threshold is, but the, the threshold for the Zerg concept is definitely a lot clearer, right? Uh, when are Zerg not Zerg? Well, when they're not scary, you know, when they're not animals, so, you know. Yeah, I think, I mean, uh, I agree, and I think, I think it's safe to say uh, uh, on, that, on that topic, on the StarCraft part of, of um, your question, that I, I've actually been really surprised that, that uh, people have been jumping to this, this, uh, this conclusion that we were saying that the Zerg were, you know, just misunderstood. Right. Um, and would turn out to be these great noble beings. Uh, I can understand that there's some fear in the community that, that that might be the case, and pretty soon you'll see Zerg, you know, weaving baskets and carrying flowers around. That's not going to happen. Uh, the, the Zerg, as Chris said, are, are absolutely the, the worst thing that can happen to your day. So, um, yeah, the, a lot of, there's a lot of stuff in their backstory. It's, it's complicated. It will all be revealed. Um, but have no fear that they will turn out to be misunderstood. <laughs> um, and as to the, to the Kerrigan part, I also, right. I mean, I, I really think that, um, I, I see the, the parallel that you're kind of talking about, but I, I don't really think it applies, because uh, Thrall was a, a character who underwent, uh, a, a, you know, 
sort of an enlightenment and sort of understood his place in the world better. Uh, Kerrigan, well, the Queen of Blades was, was an evil, terrifying creature. Sarah Kerrigan was not. I mean, Sarah Kerrigan is scary. She's, she's an assassin, right? But, um, but I, don't, I don't see it as one character that's just kind of, you know, becoming nicer. Uh, and even on that point, I, I, you, you had some really good parts of your question specifically to the is justice possible, right? Justice, or what we would presume justice is for her, uh, and a, a potential redemption, right? Are, are, you, are you neutering a gritty universe, right, and trying to overtly chase a redemption story? Um, it's a really good point, and it's a really good question. Um, how the hell do I answer it without giving away where we're going? Uh, Trust us. <laughs> it is a gritty universe, uh, and on a long enough timeline, there's so much more going on behind the curtain. It's like Wings of Liberty, like, like it barely scratches like the truth, you know, of kind of what's occurring. Uh, so you talk about justice for her, I, I don't know, it, it's, it's just, it's exactly what we're chasing, you know, in, in terms of the Heart of the Swarm storyline, so uh, be patient with us, hopefully we'll, we will answer all of this directly uh, through the gameplay, or through the storyline. Yeah, I think bad things happen to bad people in StarCraft, but bad things happen to good people too, right. so. Seemingly more often. You know? <laughs> yeah. That's exactly what I was looking for things just to be more real and right. gritty where bad things right. just corrupt bad people or good people even too. Right. Thanks. Yeah. Hey guys, pleasure to be here. Okay, uh, Star Wars. Uh, Chris, you were talking about what makes a geek. Brought up Star Wars, a lot of people say that uh, Star Wars is essentially a western in a sci-fi universe. Very much the same way as StarCraft. Uh, consider Tychus Finley. I can't help but every time I see Tychus Finley in one of the cutscenes and the dialogue, I think of Vin Diesel in Pitch Black. Just a gritty anti-hero. Um, same with Jim Rayner. You mentioned earlier about Butch Cassidy and the Sand Sundance Kid. Um, I understand the creative process. You talked about it earlier on how Tychus' character was made. I'm curious more about the outside influences that brought, that came in. Oh, well, clearly we just sat down with the Firefly box set and, you know, just took copious notes. Um, the, whole, the whole Western slash Southern thematic woven through StarCraft was <laughs> totally there in the first one that came out long before Firefly. Uh, unfortunately, it, it kind of bent a little more towards the comical, like, I love you, Sarge, you know, all that stuff. Um, but definitely in the concept art we were doing at the time, it was, I mean, it was something that I really wanted to have in the foreground. Um, and at the time, you know, we were a little split uh, on how far to chase that kind of western slash southern theme. So this time around, yeah, there, were no, uh, there was no dissension. You know, we, we, we just wanted to embrace it fully. Um, if I could have put a cowboy hat on Rainer in every scene, I would have done so, right? Uh, that's who that guy is. Um, but... You know, it's funny, when we first started, this is maybe eight years ago, seven years ago, can't tell time anymore at all, when we first started talking about StarCraft II, like, guys, we should start seriously thinking about developing this product after all these years, uh, the first image in my head was this guy sitting in a bar with a bottle of whiskey and a cowboy hat on his head fretting over a girl, you know what I mean? Like, it, it's just... It's just innately Western, you know, it's just in its, in its DNA, I guess. I don't awesome. know if that answered your question at no, all, No, it, it was perfect, because uh, I was thinking of Firefly as well, so hopefully we get to see a uh, StarCraft movie sometime. Right. You know, I was kidding about watching the Firefly box there, right? As a matter of fact, I stayed away from that damn thing, because I knew, I knew it was going to get us in trouble. Well, let's hope for a second season, at least. Huh? They're, he's doing a second season? I said let's hope for one. Oh, yeah, that would be... Epic. Thanks. Thank you. Hey guys, again, great game, fantastic. Um, I wanted to ask about, you were mentioning the next book is going to continue to explore the Tychus and uh, Rainer relationship, but one of my favorite secondary characters, of course, is Matt Horner and his sort of noble, he's kind of the, the, the heart and soul of the, you know, the, right. the, the idealistic crusader. Right. 
And I'm wondering, first of all, because I love the secondary character of Mira Han, are we ever going to get to hear about that story? <laughs> and second of all, are we ever going to get some stories about Rainer and Horner's adventures that we didn't really see because Tychus was kind of taken over? Right. I would so love to explore the Mirahan Matt Horner uh, situation. How ironic. Absolutely. Matthew. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, right now our, our focus is all on, on uh, the expansion. Um, you know, or I should say mine is. I know, I know that you're involved with pretty much everything. Wow. Um, but that, that is, I think, a very rich uh, uh, vein that we would definitely like to explore. Totally. Hello? In Wings of Liberty, you had Rainer go around the Hyperion. He was able to talk to all the other characters. He was able to flesh out his universe. Now, I'm assuming you're using the same play style. So in Legacy of the Void, you'll have Zeratul. He'll be talking to all these Protoss characters in order to enhance that. But with Kerrigan and Heart of the Swarm, who does she talk to? Is there going to be infested Terrans? Are the queens sentient? What's going to be there to make her story more interesting? That is an excellent question, which I really can't answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> Did you have any Wings of Liberty questions? A okay. uh, small one. In, um, in choosing to save the colonists, Rainer is forced to fight against Solendus. How do you explain Rainer's small band fighting against the fleet of exe the executor and uh, Whoopener? Suspension of disbelief. He's that good. <laughs> I'll believe it. Thank you. At the end of Wings of Liberty, Kerrigan undergoes yet another transformation. I was wondering as she goes back to mostly human, is she going to get her hair back or is she going to keep those wicked dreads? Uh, uh, and that is an unanswerable question at this time. We're going to keep you on the hook. But aren't they hot looking? Kind of? Is that wrong? Is it wrong that she's cute said, with those alien yeah. dreads? Is that it? Oh, fine. She'll probably keep that, keep that haircut for at least a little bit. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, so in Wings of Liberty, you introduced the new character, uh, Dr. Narad. And a lot of people online have noticed that his name is Duran spelled backwards. Uh, I just wanted to know, is that intentional? <laughs> Who would do that? That's crazy. Crazy talk. And it's Naud. Hi. So Doctor that's all you're going to give me? What's that? Is that all you're going to give me? Just... Oh, yeah. That's all it. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. My question is, did the Zelnaga let the Zerg absorb them originally? Because in the original plot, it says they underestimated them and they breached their world ships and absorbed them. But in light of the world uh, uh, StarCraft II events, where we get a little bit of info into the Zelnaga lifestyle, that might be not the case. Ten foot pool. <laughs> that one, man. This no. is dangerous, dangerous territory. Um, I feel terrible. I feel like a broken record, but I have to say, all will be revealed. Um, there is a coherent story there. There really is, I swear. Um, but uh, you're seeing the beginnings of it. Um, and uh, keep playing. <laughs> that answers my question perfectly. All right. We have time for a few more questions. Hello. I'd first like to say thank you for making a fabulous game. My question is to do with the StarCraft novels. How much leeway do you give the authors to expand the StarCraft universe? Uh, pr particularly on, I, I mean, I would say 90-something percent of our novels, uh, we outline almost every story we do these days as a team. 
um, and then we kind of well, sometimes uh, if we have the hook beforehand, like, hey, let's do a story about Mirahan, you know, um, we either, we'll discuss it, we'll outline it as a group. We have a series of uh, fiction developers on our creative development team um, that we work with to kind of, you know, develop ancillary fiction. Uh, usually we'll have a writer in mind. If we have a writer in mind for a project up front, we'll kind of fly them out to the office and have them sit with us for a day and kind of walk them through the concept so that they can kind of own, you know, uh, the construction of the thing as well, um, but uh, in terms of authors just kind of going for it and, and, and developing vast tracts of the universe, we're usually not real comfortable with that unless it's really ambient, you know, and just kind of like, you know, uh, kind of more of a vibe thing, like that's gravy, you, you got a hook, run with it, but when it gets into like like really specific kinds of uh, important locations or races or like the mythology of all this stuff, uh, we're very, very particular um, and usually, uh, usually kind of plan everything as a group uh, at our shop uh, up front. Have you ever had any of the authors come up with uh, a slamming idea and then you said, yeah, run with it? All the time. All the time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a few years ago, when you first started writing Wings of Liberty, um, did you guys have an alternate ending to the one that you ended up releasing? Uh, many. Uh, I, well, I guess I can tell you, it's not a spoiler. Um, oh, it's not all that different. Let me think about that for a minute. I was thinking about something else. Did you guys know that the, the final flick in StarCraft II, um, just a fun little piece of trivia, it was going to end with Tychus getting shot, like in a kind of godfather way and just be really, really hard, you know, so we kind of sat around and figured it'd be nice to do the old, uh, you know, cowboy carries princess off into the sunset kind of thing, but that's not what you're asking about. In terms of like, would the Rainer Kerrigan thing have gone a very different way? Uh, I really don't think so. Um, I think it was the idea that you know, to some degree, he uh, saves this girl was always kind of one of the really critical themes that define this story. Okay, then I just want to throw out another comment. person asked earlier why uh, Rainer switched from wanting to kill to save uh, Kerrigan. Was that also in the Zeratul missions, it's discovered that she has to live to save everyone. But yeah. I, you're, you're asking is, oh, no, was no. his decision, uh, oh, oh, you were, no you were throwing out another motivation, yes, yeah. yes, absolutely. No, he's, he's, he's aware that she's very important uh, to, to the future of all life, um, but I mean, I, I think, you know, as strange as it is to say, I think Jim is, is driven more by, by a very deep personal connection with Sarah. By love. <laughs> But yes, uh, the idea of all the life in the universe continuing to exist is also quite good. Thank you for attending the StarCraft II Story Q&A panel. Coming up at 6 p.m. on the main stage, we're going to have our costume song and dance contest. Thanks, guys.